The National Desk, America's News, now. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being with us. I'm Didi Gatton. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following all week. First, the voters have spoken. Senator Raphael Warnock is reelected in Georgia. Plus, President Biden says skip visiting the southern border while on a trip to Arizona. The reason why is raising some eyebrows. And taking on TikTok, Indiana is suing the video sharing social media platform, accusing it of making false claims. And later on, RSV and the flu hitting hospitals and now schools, some forced to close. Here's a look over Capitol Hill, where Democrats are celebrating Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock's runoff win, helping the president's party maintain control of the Senate. Warnock beat Trump-backed Republican Herschel Walker by nearly 100,000 votes Tuesday night, about four weeks after all other Senate seats were called. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer celebrating Democrats' victory in the chamber. 51, a slim majority. That is great, and we are so happy about it. But across the aisle, Republicans are focused on regrouping after an expected red wave during the midterms fell short of expectations. Some in the party blaming former President Donald Trump for the lost elections, while others blame close races. Well, President Trump lost again, but he said, uh, if you will, the kiss of death for somebody who wants to win a general election. I think we're losing close elections, uh, not because of Donald Trump. Now that the elections are officially over, here's where the balance of power stands in Congress. Democrats gaining a net of one Senate seat, the first time since 1934 the president's party was able to do that. Republicans gained a net of nine House seats, ultimately gaining the majority. But compared to the past century, that's about 15 to 20 fewer seats than normal. Taking a look over the White House right now, where President Biden is defending his decision to skip visiting the southern border while on a trip to Arizona. Now, the president was in the Phoenix area on Tuesday touring a new semiconductor facility, but Republicans calling on President Biden to address record high border crossings happening just a couple hundred miles away. New figures from Customs and Border Patrol showing nearly 2.4 million migrant encounters along the southern border for the fiscal year that ended in October. It's the highest ever recorded in a single term. Here's what the president said before departing for Arizona. Why, why go to a border state and not visit the border? Because there's more important thing going on. They're going to invest billions of dollars in a new enterprise. And the president pivoting to the chip shortage after the White House called recent border visit by Republican lawmakers political stunts last month. The president's comment not sitting well with the National Border Patrol Council, a union representing border agents, which fired back, saying nothing is more important than the safety and security of the American people with a record number of people and drugs, including deadly fentanyl, crossing our border illegally and evading apprehension. It is apparent Biden cares more about politics. Well, new warnings about the southern border where another surge is expected soon. Title 42 is set to end in two weeks and top officials say migrant crossings are likely to soar. The National Desk, Christine Frizzau, explaining how some on Capitol Hill are responding. In El Paso, Texas, new signs have now been erected, warning people to keep an eye out for unexpected pedestrians after a 12-year-old girl from Mexico was struck and killed. Along the southern border, more staggering numbers for the month of October. More than 230,000 migrant encounters. Compare that to 164,000 the year before and just under 72,000 the year before that. The Chief of Customs and Border Protection in Rio Grande Valley tweeting Friday agents seized the largest amount of liquid fentanyl in U.S. history. 25 pounds, enough to kill more than double the population of Houston. There's no downside to securing our border. I mean, if you secure our border, 
less criminals are coming across, which means less murders, rapists, pedophiles, and gang members, a, a fewer national security threats. With Title 42 set to expire following a court ruling and the Biden administration's own action to have it lifted, no plans have been made public for how to deal with the influx of thousands more expected. Other than the White House sending federal air marshals on mandatory deployments to the southern border. The Federal Air Marshal Council in a letter asking for marshals to stop being deployed to help at the border after at least two threatening incidents last month with no air marshals on board. A level four threat, which means someone tried to breach a cockpit two days ago on a southwest flight. So the message is, sir, please replace the air marshals on the border. Now some Republicans on Capitol Hill are threatening to vote against a bill to keep the government open if changes at the border aren't made immediately. They made the threat in a letter, also asking for border wall construction to be resumed and for President Biden to rescind executive orders which dismantled the remain in Mexico policy. The year's end bringing no end in sight to the growing challenges at the southern border. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. And right now, the investigation into the attack on a North Carolina power substation is moving forward. Federal investigators filing a search warrant in the case after authorities recovered nearly two dozen shell casings from two sites on Wednesday. The FBI now offering a $75,000 reward for any information leading to an arrest. But a new warning from the federal government says similar attacks could become more common. A memo to law enforcement agencies says substations in Washington State and Oregon recently saw similar incidents with people using hand tools and firearms to damage them. It says it's part of an online call for attacks on critical infrastructure. Just over a week ago, the Department of Homeland Security issuing an updated terrorism bulletin specifically naming infrastructure as a potential target. Well, Uncle Sam may soon be taking a bigger cut of your money. Nowadays, you can sell pretty much anything online. Got old clothes? Post it, get paid on Venmo, and a story. Now, thanks to a new tax law, you could pay for it. So I buy a lot of used stuff on Facebook, you know, Facebook Marketplace, you know, and then, and also sell. Arden Wolf has an Airbnb. She relies on Facebook Marketplace to buy and sell items, collecting payments on apps like Venmo and Cash App. Now, thanks to a new tax rule, she could get taxed for those payments. Everybody's already penny pinching and then they're still, you know, taking even more. If you use platforms like these to collect payments, you could owe more in taxes. Starting in 2023, you could get a 1099K form if you made more than $600 for the year. Before 2022, you only got it if you had more than 200 transactions and made at least $20,000 from online platforms. I think the IRS is trying to just like crack down on people receiving money through these digital platforms and not having to pay tax on it. Tax law professor at Pepperdine University, Deanna Newton, says things like personal gifts and your portion of rent should not be taxed. But if you're selling goods and services... So many people buy tickets for cheap and then they sell them. You could be taxed. For now, what I think people should do is, one, if it's for personal purposes, they should put that in the Venmo tagline or cash app and say, this is for a gift. Because if not, you run the gamut of the IRS reaching out to you and saying, hey, you need to pay taxes on this money. And Newton says, keep your records. Consider getting an LLC to minimize your tax liability. And remember, this is all very new. So if you get a form next year, you can dispute it if something looks off. New details on the vaccine mandate for the military. Service members kicked out over refusing COVID vaccines could be allowed to rejoin. Pentagon leaders are considering the matter if the vaccine mandate is lifted. Right now, Congress is set to repeal the measure as part of the must-pass defense bill. But the White House pushing back, arguing data shows the vaccine has saved the lives of service members. Republicans argue the vaccine mandate impedes on members' personal health and religious decisions. Pandemic Paycheck Protection Program fraud. Our fact check team looking at how much money was stolen and what's being done to get it back. 
Each day we're learning more and more about how some have taken advantage of the pandemic era paycheck protection program. I'm back with our fact check team now looking at how financial technology companies help facilitate this PPP fraud, pocketing millions of dollars. Connect the dots for us here, Janae. How are these companies perpetrating fraud? Well, Eugene, I've got a lot to break down for you. So those financial technology companies or fintechs did not screen out fraudulent applications for the PPP. Now, the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis released this 130-page report just a few days ago. Now, they've been investigating for over a year. Well, now, this fraud carries a pretty hefty price tag. We're talking millions of dollars. Now, for example, I have the details pulled up for you on your screen on the issues found with a company called Blue Acorn. Now, Blue Acorn received over $1 billion in taxpayer-funded processing fees. $300 million went to owners. And Blue Acorn also gave approximately two-thirds of that billion to a marketing firm controlled by members of its senior leadership team. Now, the committee also says the Blue Acorn founders arranged loans for themselves, some through their own company, and falsified key details on their applications. Now, some of these companies are passing the blame, pointing fingers elsewhere. Courtney, what are they saying? The report shows the fintechs are blaming the Trump administration for mismanaging the PPP. On your screens is an example of an email from one of the fintechs being investigated. They say it's the SBA's rules that created the fraud. And now this is all taxpayer funded. Should we expect to get some of this money back? It's a big maybe. The committee made 11 recommendations, including having the Justice Department prosecute PPP fraud and urging the SBA to carefully consider whether fintechs should be permitted to play a part in future lending programs. But again, these are just recommendations. Yeah, it sounds like this is far from over, but it's good to get this breakdown of where we're at right now. Ladies, thanks. And you can take a deeper dive into this PPP investigation and the fact check team sources for this by scanning the QR code there on your screen or head on over to the website, the nationaldesk.com. Ahead on the National Desk, security concerns. Why one Utah school district's efforts to protect students from possible future mass casualty events is not in line with the fire department. Plus, eliminating loopholes. How a new bill in California aims to change penalties for fentanyl dealers. The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting in Utah, where a school district's efforts to protect students from possible future mass casualty events is at odds with the fire department. Most schools built before 2000 have classroom doors that only lock from the hallway. And studies have shown that causes a vulnerability during shootings. I have to go out into the hall and spend an extra 30 to 60 seconds locking my door. So many teachers have tried to compromise with doorstop tools like the lock block. If, God forbid, we suddenly hear shots, all we do is move this thing an inch, you know, half inch to the right, and the door closes and now it's locked. 
But this cheap, simple system is something the state fire marshal said was in violation and had to be taken down. The doors are required to close and latch. Most classroom doors are fire rated, meaning they're designed to keep smoke and flames out of the room during a fire. But that only works if they're latched shut at all times. State Fire Marshal Ted Black says door stops like the lock block would make the system useless in a fire. And he told me that devices like this have been found and taken down in pretty much every school district in Utah. School districts like Alpine have managed to find the funds to satisfy both requirements. We went and changed all of the doors out so that you have the push button lock. If a teacher um, hears that there's a lockdown, all they have to do is come over to the door, push the push the lock and it locks the door. And they're currently in the process of saving funds to replace the locks in their middle school and high school doors as well. It saves time and, and really in an event that could save lives. Over to California now, where Republican State Assemblyman Jim Patterson says his new proposed bill eliminates a loophole for fentanyl dealers who only face a misdemeanor when caught with a small amount. Current penalties are based on the weight of the drug, and some officials want to see that change. We need new laws that are pertinent to fentanyl. Fentanyl is a, is a poison. It is not just a drug. It is a poison. And such a small amount of it can kill people. Um, we have to distinguish that drug. Patterson says there's no reason his bill shouldn't get bipartisan support. And in South Carolina, Justin G., a man with special needs and a medical implant, says he was treated poorly by TSA agents at the airport in Charleston. He says agents began questioning him after he requested a pat down instead of going through a body scanner on his doctor's advice, saying that triggered him to have a panic attack in the middle of the airport. They made me feel embarrassed. They made me feel uncomfortable. And I hope this never happens to a special needs person. He posted a video about it on Twitter. Charleston Airport staff responding, saying they will hold a meeting with the officers involved in the incident. Up next on the national desk, hit hard by the triple demic. A superintendent describing the impact the surge in respiratory viruses is having on our nation's schools. The triple-demic of RSV, the flu, and COVID-19 now emptying classrooms. Schools have shut down in a number of states, including Oklahoma, where the Thomas Faye Custer Unified School District had to go virtual. The district superintendent discussed the decision this week with our Eugene Ramirez. Monday, we started out with about 118 out and ended the day with 161. So it was just a huge number that continued to grow significantly throughout the day and it was throughout the entire district. So we felt like that was the best case scenario to try to get our kids separated away from it if we could for a couple of days and then see sure. where it went from there. Now you uh, all went virtual yesterday and again today. I believe you're going back to the class tomorrow, but these respiratory illnesses are expected to continue being a problem through the spring. So what's your next move here? Uh, even if students go back to class tomorrow, could you go virtual again in the near future? And what's going to determine that? Uh, if if we have a situation like Monday again, we would we would go virtual again if we have to. But uh, our goal is to have kids in the classroom if at all possible. And we'll we'll do about anything we can to make sure that the kids are in class. But 
if we have a huge spike like we did on Monday, then we would go back to virtual if we have to. But that's that is never the that's never the desired option. Sure. And, and look, parents all across the country right now are concerned about learning loss, also mental health issues that came from COVID related school closures over the past few years, which, by the way, also caused parents to miss work because they had to stay home with the kids. What have you heard from the parents there in your district, not only about this week's decision, uh, but as we were just saying, you know, in the future, should you have to do this again and again and again through the spring and perhaps beyond that? Uh, we've we've had a pretty good track record of staying in school, and we're we're going to continue to do that if at all possible. So we're going to approach it like this is a rare occurrence for us, and if if we have to make some adjustments, we will. But for the most part, we're going to approach this like it's just kind of an anomaly, and we're gonna we're gonna assume that we're going to be in class as much as humanly possible because we do we realize it's a hardship for the parents. So sure, we want. <laughs> We want to make sure that we take care of the kids. Yeah, you know, doctors that we've had here on the show and, and the medical community, uh, medical community at large um, has largely blamed pandemic era virtual learning for this immunity debt that we're seeing in kids that's resulted in this year's much earlier respiratory illness surge. Uh, what conversations have you had with any, uh, if any, with health officials there in your state or medical professionals about whether this week's move, especially if it's going to happen again soon, uh, may possibly do more harm than good? And are you exploring any other options to, you know, to, to maybe not do the virtual learning, but maybe have the kids wear masks or social distance? What else are you looking at? Well, we've, we've gotten pretty decent at the social distancing thing and uh, we'll, you know, I, don't, I don't know that the mask thing will come into play here, but uh, we've talked to the county health department, visited with them a little bit about it, not necessarily about Monday's situation, but overall and in the grand scheme of things, we're going to plan on coming to school and if, if our kids if we have a huge outbreak, then we'll do something different. But just, just right quickly, now, like unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to ask you quickly, was there any medical professional involved in, in this decision-making process? Or is this something that you just had to do immediately and, and move quickly on? No, it was just an immediate, it was just an on-the-spot deal because of the numbers. Understood. Rob Friesen, we wish your students and your staff lots of health, and hopefully this won't become a recurring issue for you guys there uh, in that district. Thanks for speaking with me tonight. Mm, thank you. Rupert Murdoch set to be deposed. Coming up, the $1.6 billion lawsuit the Fox News CEO is named in. You're watching The National Desk, America's News Now. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, police in North Texas say a FedEx driver confessed to kidnapping and murdering a seven-year-old girl. Tanner Horner told investigators he strangled Athena Strand after accidentally hitting her with his van. And the body of a battered child found in a box 65 years ago in Philadelphia has finally been identified. Investigators ID'd four-year-old Joseph Augustus Zarelli using DNA analysis. The case is one of Philadelphia's oldest unsolved homicides. Emmy-winning actress Kirstie Alley has died. Her family says the 71-year-old died Monday after a short battle with colon cancer. Those stories and much more are available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, on Monday, Florida lawmakers will meet for a special session on property insurance. The session comes following the damage done by Hurricane Ian. Rupert Murdoch is said to be deposed on Tuesday in Dominion Voting's defamation lawsuit against the Fox Corporation and its cable TV networks. And the federal government running out of money Friday. Talks for a long-term spending plan are stalled, and lawmakers say a short-term resolution will be needed to avoid a shutdown. 
Your money may not go as far as some stores right now, and you can thank your retail theft for that. As the National Desk, Kayla Gaskins reports, the crimes could even force some places out of business. Shoplifting causing big problems for one of the nation's largest retailers. Theft is an issue. It's higher than what has historically been. Walmart CEO Doug McMillan saying they will have to change the way they do business if crime trends continue. If that's not corrected over time, prices will be higher right. and or stores will close. Walmart is not alone. During an earnings call last month, the CEO of Target blaming organized retail crime for $400 million of losses. Over the summer, San Francisco police arresting a man and seizing $200,000 worth of stolen goods. CEOs and business leaders placed the blame on the decriminalizing of lower-level theft, a policy promoted by progressive prosecutors and a move they say emboldens would-be criminals. Places like San Francisco and New York, they have basically said, look, if you're stealing under $1,000 worth of merchandise, it's no longer a felony. With few options, companies increasingly choosing to place shelf items behind lock and key. A gas station in Philadelphia hiring armed guards. We have a right to protect this property in the, any means necessary and whatever force necessary to be used. The bill for these increased security measures and the lost revenue from stolen goods is often passed on to the consumer if businesses want to survive. The costs incurred by retail centers from stolen merchandise, that's passed along to consumers. These stores are having to put in place additional security personnel, security cameras, plexiglass. This crime-driven inflation adding to the economic burden already being carried by Americans. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. Kayla, thank you. Up next here on the National Desk, targeting teens. The allegations in a new lawsuit against TikTok and parents weigh in what worries them when their kids use the app. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back.
the National Desk, America's News, now. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton, taking on TikTok. The state of Indiana accusing the video sharing social media platform of making false claims. In a pair of lawsuits, Indiana's Attorney General accused TikTok of deceiving its users with a major focus on how the app targets children. The AG claiming the app's algorithm is designed to make it addictive. And once kids are hooked, it promotes material that is not age appropriate. Court documents specifically mention content about hallucinogenic drugs and how to make alcohol taste like candy, along with videos of strippers. The state says that's a direct violation of TikTok's 12 and up rating in the App Store. In order to hold that status, an app should be able to prove that references to things like alcohol, drugs, and sexual content are, quote, infrequent and mild. The second lawsuit says the company is misleading leading its users when it comes to personal data. Indiana says TikTok does not disclose how much of your information it has access to. The company did not specifically comment on the brewing legal battle, but released a statement saying the safety, privacy and security of our community is our top priority. Going on to add, we build youth well-being into our policies, limit features by age and empower parents with tools and resources, saying they also invest in new ways to keep the platform age appropriate. In its lawsuits, Indiana is seeking up to $5,000 per violation, as well as changes to TikTok's policies. And tonight, Texas joining the growing list of states banning government employees from using TikTok on state-owned devices. Maryland issuing a similar ban after South Dakota and South Carolina did the exact same thing last week. Further, Wisconsin could be moving in the same direction as state lawmakers call for a TikTok ban for government officials. Now, despite TikTok's claims of youth well-being policies, the lawsuits are renewing concerns about what some call inappropriate and sometimes potentially dangerous content displayed to minors using the app. Now parents are telling me they're doing everything they can to protect their children online. Scrolling through TikTok, you're bound to find a challenge. How to make ammo for your RB's gun. Or two. <laughs> or three. Benadryl challenge is when you take 12 Benadryls to hallucinate. Content that has been linked to deadly consequences among America's youth. Parents nationwide voicing their concerns. You know, it's just becoming harder to, to shield, um, you know, youth from certain things. From a father of three to a mother of four, they're all navigating this new world of social media. The oldest, yes, she's obviously in charge of all of her own social media. The littles, our 10-year-old and our 8-year-old, we try to, in our family, limit um, device use as much as possible. This week, in the first state lawsuits against TikTok, Indiana's attorney general sued the Chinese-owned media platform in an effort to keep families like these safe. The complaint calls for transparency on the age appropriateness of its content, further claiming the company deceives people about how much data is collected. Anything that's directing content that's not youth appropriate towards youth is is uh I mean, there's a lot of negative adjectives I could throw out there, but anything in that regard is just it's disheartening. Parents trying to get a handle on the 24-7 exposure to content that could be unsafe. I've seen like different uh, TikTok videos too, like um, like via YouTube. And so one of the things that you know I was big on was just making sure that again, there were guardrails up. Absolutely, we as conscious adults ought to be making better decisions for what we're allowing into our young people's minds. A lot of people with a lot of money um, in those places don't care so much about the emotional impact and trauma that we're causing young people and, and what it's causing um, in our next generation. Republican lawmakers on Capitol Hill are calling for Twitter execs to testify before Congress following Elon Musk's release of communications surrounding the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins reports. The fallout of the Twitter files hitting Washington. More and more we do see 
big media, big government, big tech having to acknowledge that this wasn't Russian disinformation. Newly released company conversations show the social media giant temporarily hushed a negative story about the Biden family ahead of the 2020 election. Employees at the time worried the information came from hackers, despite lacking evidence. Republicans aiming at answers. We should never allow it to happen in our country again where there's a news story that's very relevant to an election and we allow the wagons to be circled and the American people to be shielded from that content. The White House brushing off the issue. Twitter was so haphazardly pushed this distraction. Uh, that is a that is a full of uh, old news, if you think about it. Cornell Law Professor William Jacobson arguing the matter deserves attention. I think they're still trying to kill the story, that this is a huge story. This is not a story about a laptop. It's the Biden family corruption story. It's really a story of Joe Biden selling his office as vice president and selling access to him when he was, uh, you know, a potential candidate for the presidency. Even if mainstream media outlets don't appear to be granting much coverage. I find it very discouraging and disappointing that mainstream media outlets are not willing to acknowledge even after the fact that there was real news in October of 2020 about that laptop, but also the way that that laptop story was stifled is news now. Mainstream media outlets are too interested in kind of shaping the political sphere rather than to reporting honestly. Republican lawmakers on Capitol Hill have questions about the FBI's role in suppressing the story, questions they hope a full investigation will answer. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. Ex-Twitter boss Jack Dorsey urging Elon Musk to go public with all the files, tweeting in part, why not just release everything without filter and let people judge for themselves? Musk responded saying that everything in time will be released. A Supreme showdown. The high court takes up the case of a Colorado wedding website designer refusing business to same-sex couples. She claims she finds it offensive. People inside the court say the conservative majority appears to be sympathetic to the designer, but liberal justices raise concerns about hypotheticals like a designer who's against interracial marriages or doesn't believe disabled people should get married. The web designer says it's about freedom of expression, but Colorado officials say it could leave room for exclusion. Colorado is trying to force me to create custom, unique artwork to promote ideas inconsistent with my faith and the core of who I am. No government official should be able to do that to eat any of us. And if there were to be a loophole of the kind discussed, people with disabilities, African Americans, Jews, Muslims, others could find themselves without access to the marketplace. That's what this case is about. Colorado's current law states if an individual offers a service to the public, that individual has to provide it to all customers or be fined up to $500. The U.S. Supreme Court is taking on a case that could give states more power in elections. North Carolina Republican lawmakers are asking the justices to adopt the independent state legislature doctrine that would let state legislatures to set rules in federal elections without any restrictions from courts or other authorities. Voting rights groups warn it would lead to state legislatures having absolute authority without judicial oversight. New details tonight. The Biden administration has appealed a court's ruling blocking Title 42, which is set to expire in less than two weeks. The pandemic era policy calling for the immediate removal of migrants who illegally cross into the U.S. from Mexico. More than one million migrants have been expelled under Title 42. The Biden administration has relied on it to help curb an increase in migration at the border. Without it in place, all migrants arrested at the border must be processed under immigration law. The nation in the grips of an opioid epidemic. Our fact check team digging into what role the southern border plays in the deadly problem. 
The Biden administration's border policy has increasingly become a target for Republican critics amid a growing number of border encounters and fentanyl deaths. I'm back with Courtney and Janae from the Fact Check team. The Biden administration says it's making progress in this fight against fentanyl, citing a three-month decline in deaths. But Janae, you looked at the numbers for us. What are the facts? So Eugene, more than 150 people die every day from overdoses related to synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Now we pulled some data from the CDC. Take a look. In 2020, there were just under 58,000 fentanyl related deaths that number jumped to over 71,000 in 2021 and in the 12 month period ending in June of 2022 there were more than 102,000 reported deaths yeah, some big jumps there now we've seen these images on social media of the drugs many of them coming across the US Mexico border right so we looked at the latest annual data and found that Customs and Border Protection seized nearly 656,000 pounds of fentanyl and just over 288,000 of that was at the southern border yeah, interestingly though something that's American citizens not migrants who are making these cross-border drug runs. So that's uh, an interesting fact there. But Janae, what's the administration's plan? How do we move forward from here? So the administration is working to make more drugs like Narcan, which are effective at reversing opioid overdoses, more widely available. Now they've encouraged drug companies to apply for permission to sell the drugs over the counter, and the FDA is set to fast track the process. Okay, with border crossings right now at a record high, Customs and Border Protection uh, have seen an increase in deaths by suicide. Sadly, uh, Courtney, you'll looked into this for us. Give us just a fact here. Right. Customs and Border Protection has reported 14 deaths by suicide this year, with three in November alone. Now, that's the highest number we've seen since 2009, which saw 14 as well. Yeah, is the situation uh, or the conditions uh, at the border to blame for all these suicides? It's unclear, but Republican Congressman Tony Gonzalez of Texas said that the long hours and scenes at the border are pushing agents to their breaking point. Now, how do these suicide numbers compare to numbers for the U.S. as a whole? Both are growing. In 2021, there were nearly 48 thousand deaths by suicide according to the CDC. Now that's a four percent increase after two consecutive years of decline. Okay some sad stats there. Ladies thank you for your research and you can dive deeper into border issues and also find the links that the fact check team used for sources for their information by scanning that QR code at the bottom of your screens or visiting the nationaldesk.com. FEMA denial despair. Straight ahead, the federal agency's reasoning for refusing aid to counties hit hard by historic flooding. Then, veterans getting a benefit boost. The new program now available for vets with service-related disabilities. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting with FEMA turning down disaster relief for West Virginia flood victims. It has been miserable. I mean, every day it's been like, what am I going to do? You know, what's coming next? And the holidays coming up. More than a foot of water in her house. Rhonda Hudson lost everything. Now living out of bags and boxes and staying warm with an electric heater. She says if her story and others are not enough for FEMA, what is? We're all upset up here. FEMA ruled there was not enough widespread damage for Kanawha County to be approved for a disaster declaration. West Virginia Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, or VOAC, since August 15th helped about 471 families in both Kanawha and Fayette counties. We will not turn anyone away. 
it may take us a little bit longer to get help to them. The state has already started the appeal process and flood victims like Hudson hoping FEMA will take a much closer look at Eastern Canal County. I know a lot of people from other states has it worse, but we're having it bad too. You can't leave us out. We really are excited about because it's responsive to what veterans have been asking for uh, and hopefully we'll be able to help meet their needs. VA Life is open to all veterans with any level of service-connected disability, 80 and under. There are no time limits to apply and there's no medical underwriting questions being asked. This is creating more access than ever before in response to their ask. What's more, this is a whole life policy. Veterans who qualify can enroll for up to $40,000 in benefits. Whole life insurance programs really do talk to meeting end of life costs for burials or reception or paying off lingering bills. Each policy builds in cash value after the first two years of enrollment. And there are amounts available in $10,000 increments all the way up to $40,000 all of it helps every little bit of it that's one less thing i have to get at the grocery store that's why rita martinez first started coming to the edgewood school district's community food pantry and resource center it's men having oh, food on our table now she volunteers helping others deal with inflation as they pick up chicken turkey canned goods hygiene products clothes bikes and toys for the holidays sometimes this is all they have. EISD detective Rosa Roscoe runs the center, picking up items where she can find them and spreading goodwill in a district where 93% of the 9,000 students are economically disadvantaged. It's not always easy. And as you can see, we're running a little low. All of the items are donated, including washers and dryers so people can do their laundry for free. So I come on Thursdays, come and wash your clothes. An average of 35 people visit the facility daily. If you've never been poor, you, you can't understand uh... Um, the needs of just simply I'm hungry and opening up the refrigerator door and there's there's nothing there. Seems like it's making an impact. So to come here, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from mixed signals about the U.S. economy to how the Fed is reacting. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. For some perspective, I'm joined by national correspondent Kayla Gaskins. Kayla, mixed messages with the economy. Retail sales are robust this holiday season amid higher prices and a looming recession. And a new poll showing only a quarter of Americans think the economy is in good shape. It's not that just the average American, though, that's worried about the economy, right? No, it's not. So CEOs and Wall Street experts are on a whole pretty worried about where the economy is headed. Jamie Dimon, he's the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, saying that Americans are saving less money and they're actually dipping into that savings money for spending money. And he predicts that that means consumer spending will go down heading forward, which is another indicator that we're possibly headed towards a recession. Um, and some experts are also saying the housing market is already in a recession. As interest rates soar, home sales have dropped more than 30% in November, and they're now at the lowest level that they've been in a decade. So what is the federal government doing to try to head off a recession? Well, the Federal Reserve is using really the only tool necessary, and that is interest rates. So we expect their next interest rate hike that they'll announce at their meeting next week to be half a percent. That's a 
little bit lower than what we've seen the Federal Reserve do since June when they've been uh, implementing three quarters of a percent interest rate hike. So they're slowing it down a little, but there's still nothing small about a half a point increase. So the Federal Reserve still being very aggressive as they try to rein in inflation. We'll also get the new inflation numbers next week. So that'll give us a better view of where the economy is right now and the Federal Reserve will use that information as they make their next decision. Yeah, and there was another data point out on Friday showing uh, wholesale uh, inflation up. Uh, I think that's probably going to play uh, pretty deeply into what the Fed's trying to decide. Uh, we're going to be watching very, very closely uh, this week on what the Fed's doing. But we're also seeing gas prices dropping to their lowest point in a year. But we're not out of the woods yet regarding energy prices. What are you seeing? No, and President Biden has made it a point to make sure everybody in America is aware that gas prices are at the lowest point that we've seen in a very long time. But looking forward, it's not so clear that prices will be heading in the right direction for very long. And a lot of that has to do with OPEC and their decision to continue cutting production through 2023. Now, this is against what America would like to see. America would like OPEC to increase production so that they will be able to lower global gas prices, but OPEC doing the exact opposite. And then heading into winter, energy costs in general are soaring. There's actually some numbers out of Minnesota and they say if you're heating your house with oil, you can expect your heating bill to be 16% higher this winter compared with last winter. And if you heat your house with natural gas, that number could be as high as 28% higher this year compared with last year. So Americans are really being hit on all fronts. Not only are consumer goods a lot more expensive, but even those home heating bills and gasoline bills, the price you pay to fill up your car is all continuing to stay a lot higher. And that, Steve, is really hurting Americans all around. And playing into politics as well. I mean, we're seeing gas prices, as you said, lowest in the point in the last year in the Biden administration trying to take credit for that. But his critics say it's still higher than it was when he took office in January 2021. And uh, we mentioned polls earlier, and there's a new poll out on Friday showing that uh, most Americans or a majority of Americans think the economy is going in the wrong direction. So we'll see how this all plays out uh, in, in the coming weeks and months. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, thank you. Didi, back to you. Stephen Kayla, thanks. Governor Ron DeSantis reportedly hosting a dinner in Miami Sunday with some of his top donors. It's fueling speculation he may be planning a 2024 presidential run. An invitation sent out this week, the event is described as a celebration of DeSantis' recent victories and a chance to discuss his political future. The dinner will be uh, DeSantis' first known gathering with donors since the midterm elections last month. Ahead on the national desk, all work and not as much play. The lengths some Americans are going to make ends meet. When your money just isn't enough, make more of it. That's what many in the U.S. are doing, trying to catch up with inflation. Having just one job isn't cutting it for some. The number of people holding multiple jobs jumped 165,000 in November, according to new federal labor numbers. Experts telling me the current state of the economy is forcing many to make tough choices. Kind of anxious about the inflation and prices rising and a drop in income. In a nutshell, it's how many people are feeling. 
With inflation the highest it's been in decades, people nationwide are reevaluating their finances. In a new Neighbor.com survey, two out of three Americans say they are either working or plan to pick up a side gig just to keep up. More often than not, when we hear people saying we want a second job or we need a second job, it's to cover basic household expenses. Franchise owner of staffing agency Pride Staff Matt Becker says he sees people taking on more jobs, dipping into savings and relying on credit cards, whatever they have to do to make ends meet. It's all about the money. I mean, at the end of the day, inflation is killing people uh, metaphorically because the raises they're getting are not is not historically been keeping up with inflation this year. In November, hourly earnings jumped 0.6% and wages matter. A ResumeBuilder.com survey found about one in 20 workers would quit if they learned their co-workers make more money. It's key for the employee to really be cognizant of where they're playing so that they've got the right salary expectations for that particular role. On the employer side, they got it. They have to become more flexible. And for a sense of just how widespread this is, Becker tells me from high school grads to retirees, they're all looking for jobs right now. New details, Congress moving forward with an investigation into Live Nation and Ticketmaster after the botched rollout of Taylor Swift tour tickets. The Bipartisan Energy and Commerce Committee wants to hear from the company. In a letter, lawmakers said the recent presale, which saw reports of lockouts, bots and scammers, quote, raises concerns over the potential unfair and deceptive practices that face consumers and event goers. The committee has been investigating the live event ticket industry since 2019. Their last hearing with Ticketmaster was in 2020 over similar issues. Now they're asking them to share any progress they've made in the last three years. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. And you can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.